Hello, everyone. I'm here today to tell you something about understanding human language. I like to start my talks with people. People have needs for information and communication, both business needs and social needs. They largely achieve their goals by using the most marvelous invention of human people, which is language. For computers to be able to communicate easily with us, and for computer systems to be able to access and understand the information that is available to humans who make decisions, then we need to have computers that are able to understand human languages. The classic statistic that you see in the big data industry is that 80% of business relevant information is in unstructured form, primarily text. Um, it's pretty unclear where this number comes from. It might have been invented by a Merrill Lynch consultant. It possibly comes from an IBM study in the 1990s. There's no particular reason to think that that number's um, true in the 2020s. But on the other hand, I think we all know that business mainly runs on email, reports, proposals, contracts, texts, and increasingly on making use of social media. And all of these things are primarily human language material. For about 30 years, getting information out of text was mainly approached via feature-based machine learning models. These work pretty well for quite a lot of the core natural language processing tasks. So for things like finding person and company names in a piece of text, or doing sentiment analysis, working out whether a piece of text is positive or negative. There are a number of good toolkits for these kind of operations, such as Core NLP and Stanza that we've built at the Stanford NLP group. However, if you wanted to go deeper and you wanted to do more complete understanding of human language, the traditional answer was that you had to code building a lot more structure and meaning behind the text, which might be done by handwritten grammars, mapping to a formal semantics and then perhaps to SQL, or it might be done more by probabilistic grammar rules with machine learning from data, which has been hand annotated for logical meaning representations. Either way, Building systems or resources to do that was extremely costly, and attempts to build such systems weren't very robust, they weren't very scalable, and they weren't very widely deployed. But that all changed in 2018. There's been an enormous revolution in natural language understanding in the last five years, driven by the development of a new generation of large language models which learn about the structure, but also about the meaning of text by using self-supervised learning on huge quantities of text data. In particular, the BERT and GPT-3 models are well-known large language models. There are, there are now many others and more coming out each week. While the first small attempts um, to do this made use of existing long-standing neural network models, all of the new recent models make use of a brand new neural network technology that was invented in 2017, transformer language models. Um, I'm not going to go through all the math, but really all these models do is that they learn to play the Mad Libs game. So you're given a bit of context, and what the model is trying to do is predict the word that appears next or within a certain context in a piece of text. You just train it by rewarding correct guesses and punishing it for wrong guesses by the usual kind of stochastic gradient descent. Now, at first sight, this doesn't exactly seem like it could possibly be the path to artificial intelligence. However, it turns out that this is a very effective task, precisely because predicting words can depend on any aspect of the text's meaning and any knowledge of the general world around you. And so it works very well as a universal pre-training method that gives models wide understanding that can then be deployed for all sorts of particular tasks. Indeed, the use of transformer models and the technique of self-supervised learning by prediction have now been 
so successful that they've started to be applied to other modalities as well. So for example, we have vision transformers um, and where the models can now learn visual representations just unsupervised from filling in blanked out parts of images rather than requiring huge hand labeled data sets like the traditional models like ImageNet. This development of powerful reconfigurable models that can be trained by self-supervision on unannotated data across modalities and multimodally, so you have both image and text models, um, has been sufficiently revolutionary that at Stanford we decided the approach deserved a new name and we dubbed it foundation models, which I think Peter Norvig has already spoken to you some about this morning. Um, one of the most impressive examples of a foundation model, particularly if, like most of you, um, you're programmers, has been the development of models that can translate from human language to code. The best known example of that is OpenAI's Codex, a descendant of which is now available to everyone as GitHub Copilot or you can just simply use it in VS Code. So I can write a comment saying what I want to have happen. I want to have a routine that will um, do sentiment analysis, and GitHub Copilot can just fill in a method that will do that by calling a SAS API. For human language material, large language models can revolutionize information access. Rather than traditional search where you made a query and got back a list of pages that hopefully are relevant, now you can ask a question and a large foundation model can go and read web pages and then just give you the answer. This technology is especially valuable when people are working on phones rather than desktops and interaction with small screens and keyboards is difficult. There are many models for this. One I worked on recently was Yono, which uses a T5 large model fine-tuned for question answering three times. First to work out which documents to retrieve, then to re-rank those retrieved documents, and then finally to read them to find the answer to a question. Better human language understanding can translate directly into financial returns. An example of that from a few years ago is that my colleague Eric Brynjolfsson did a study as eBay switched over from early 2010 statistical machine translation to a modern neural machine translation system. Just having better Spanish translations on the site was enough to increase sales to Latin America by more than 10%. Let me now give three quick looks at some recent work of me and my colleagues. Over the last five years, large language models have brought dramatic progress in natural language understanding tasks. One commonly used benchmark for that is the GLUE benchmark, which combines various natural language understanding things like question answering and inference. Early neural network work already greatly improved our performance on this benchmark and got us close to 70%. But with the adoption of large pre-trained language models, things rapidly got better starting from 2018. And so by 2020, we had models which were measured as outperforming the performance of human beings. Though you should remember that's the performance of human beings trying to work at speed so as to earn minimum wage on Amazon Mechanical Turk rather than necessarily the true limits of human performance. However, if you change um, the x-axis of that graph from time to the amount of compute used to pre-train these models, then you get a very different picture and progress does not look so great. So the earliest models like ELMO required about 35 times as much compute as an early neural model based on GloVe, and it only gave a 2.5% increase in performance. As we've gone on from there for successive generations, what we find is that each new generation of model is taking about 10 times as much compute as the last model, so we're going up by orders of magnitude for, of compute required for every approximately linear or in recent times even sublinear increase in performance on tasks. 
So my colleague Andrew Ng has suggested that AI is the new electricity. But when you look at graphs like this, it actually seems more like the opposite. It seems like electricity is the new AI. By burning enough electricity, you can make the numbers as good as you want them to make. But that's not a very scalable model. And it's clearly not what happens with human intelligence, right? Human brains run on almost no electricity, right? They run on less electricity than a 25-watt light bulb. Um, so one of the things I've been interested in with colleagues is how we can build more efficient large language models. And so one method that we worked on, especially Kevin Clark, former PhD student, was the Electra model. And the idea of the Electra model was to change the task to one of distinguishing original words from ones that have been replaced in a text. This is more efficient as it's a binary task that can be tested on every word. Um, so what we want in our performance is both better performance by moving upwards, but we also want better performance by moving leftwards so that we require less computation and hence energy usage to train better models. So our goal is actually to be up in the top left corner. So it's not the last word, but the Electra model took a meaningful step in moving you out into that left corner. Um, here's another example. Um, oops. Um, okay, it's now well known that you can get models like GPT or GPT-3 to produce very coherent long-form stories. Um, but if you're thinking of actual user use cases, no one is going to want to just press go and have a complete story written for them. What you actually want is an environment where a model like GPT-3 can be an effective co-author. So my colleagues, Minya Li and Percy Liang, have worked on a system, co-author, which allows a human to collaborate effectively with GPT-3 on writing. So GPT-3 is used like a high-end autocomplete system, which can suggest sentences or the completions of sentences, which humans can then work with and revise. Finally, large language models have many, many problems. They often suffer from biases, gender biases, racial biases. They easily produce toxic text. But they also have problems simply because the material they are trained on gets out of date. And so they will make factual errors. So if you ask Google's recent T5 large model, fine-tuned on question answering like I saw before, who is the Prime Minister of Australia, it doesn't do very well. It doesn't just give you the previous Prime Minister. It actually answers with the person that's two Prime Ministers back, um, as will come up in a moment, Malcolm Turnbull. Um, so that's not a very useful answer if you want factual information. So, with, um, Eric Mitchell and um, colleagues have worked, and me have worked on how can you do lightweight editing of large language models so you can very cheaply put new facts into them. So we can tell it that the answer who is the Prime Minister of Australia should be, if we go to the middle stage first, Scott Morrison. And now if one asks the neural network um, who's the Prime Minister of Australia, it'll answer correctly Scott Morrison. But this isn't just um, memorizing that answer to that question. It's actually doing a lightweight update to the weights of the neural network. So if you ask it in a different way and say, who is Australia's prime minister, it also now knows that's Scott Morrison. And of course, you don't want this updating um, to be too general. You want it to still be the case that if you ask who is the prime minister of India, that that's still giving you an answer of Narendra Modi and not answering that question as well, Scott Morrison. And so then as events change, you can continue to update it. So I could update it again and now say who is the Prime Minister of Australia is the new Prime Minister from a few months ago, Anthony Albanese, and then I'd be able to go back and ask the questions, and it now knows that information. Yeah, so that's a quick tour of um, some of the ideas of doing natural language understanding. I just want to end by emphasizing the general point that when people think about artificial intelligence, they normally fixate on an individual human brain and understanding an individual human brain. But humans and human society in the 21st century aren't actually powerful because of an individual human brain. 
We're powerful because the development of language gave us a way to network human brains together and a storage mechanism for ideas. So, you know, a lot of the evidence suggests that an individual human being isn't much more intelligent than a chimpanzee. Chimps can do many of the things we see as hallmarks of intelligence, such as using tools and planning, and for some tasks like short-term memory, they're actually better at it than we are. But within the history of life on Earth, humans developed language really recently, but the power of communication set off our ascendancy over other creatures because we could communicate, share information, and work more effectively together as teams. And then, you know, that got us a fair way, it got us to the Bronze Age, but it was then way, way more recently than that, only about 5,000 years ago, that humans developed writing, and that then gave us a mechanism for ideas, thoughts, instructions to be shared across distances of time and space. And in just a few thousand years, that took us from the Bronze Age to the modern cell phones and all the other gizmos and developments that we have today. So therefore, we have this form of network societal intelligence through language. And so if we are ever going to have intelligent computers that can operate, learn, and contribute in a human world, those computers are going to have to be good at understanding human languages. Thank you. Thank you.